Hi, so welcome to our afternoon session with, with Ben Hatchings about Secure Boot for Debian. And if you have, uh, probably you have many questions, so I have two, uh, two micros. So raise your hands, I will try to arrange to give you the micros. Thank you. Uh, well, I don't actually, actually have very much to say. Uh, I, don't <laughs> I don't, won't be able to answer questions because uh, I don't know a lot of this. Uh, I'm just trying to bring people together so that we actually have some sort of a discussion. Um, between people who do have plans, who have looked into the uh, the various components that are needed to make the, uh, that are needed to support Secure Boot, um, and maybe st maybe uh, start making some progress on that again. Uh, so, anyone want to start? Hey, I'm uh, happy to kick off with uh, with what we've done in Ubuntu. Uh, I'm Colin Watson. Uh, I did a uh, proportion of the secure boot enablement in Ubuntu. Um, the so you have to have a number of elements in the stack. Obviously, we uh, we started with uh, um, within uh, the the things you need in Grub to be able to uh, to. Uh, boot and secure boot mode at all. Um, obviously, you need a signed image, um, which is not terribly difficult in itself, uh, but you do also need to make sure that you uh, disable module loading. Uh, the, uh, the the main constraint in, in uh, secure boot, uh, sorry, in secure boot uh, that's enforced by the spec is that uh, you must not load unsigned code before exit boot services, which is the firmware call that you make at the end of the, um, uh, somewhere around the end of the bootloader sequence. Um, so uh, so we have a set of patches which uh, we put together with Fedora um, to, uh, uh, to try to effectively harden Grub for that. Uh, those work fine, those are in Debian. Uh, they're, tur they're currently turned off by a Debian rules switch, but it's trivial to enable. Um, there's a few other things around that. Uh, you have to um, have corresponding changes to a couple of bits of the installer. Um, and uh, you also have to uh, somehow, but you have to arrange for the, the signing to, to happen in the right place. Uh, so we, uh, we patched our archive software uh, to accept a custom upload type, which is kind of the same as the way uh, installer images are produced. Um, when it uh, when it sees uh, an upload of this upload type, then it asks a human for confirmation, uh, and uh, if it gets that, then it will sign that with a uh, sign the upload with uh, an object stored or with a key that's uh, that's stored on the archive master system, um, so FTP master. Um, we'd have to we'd have to port that code to DAC, I guess, but uh, it doesn't. I had a brief look, and it doesn't look terribly difficult to do. Um, so the uh, the last piece, or the last and most important piece is that uh, you, in in practice, uh, secure, while it is, it is possible, and it's very important that it's possible for users to be able to install their own keys on a secure boot system. If you, if you can't do that, then it really is horrendously non-free. Um, However, uh, we don't. It's, it's not really very nice to for users to have to install their own keys simply in order to um, install an operating system. Uh, it's it's possible. Um, you can certainly do that, uh, but it means that uh, you have to go through all these very non-standard kernel mod uh, kern sorry firmware menus to. Uh, uh, to I in, I you often have to type in strings of hexadecimal and all that sort of thing. It's uh, it's not very much fun. Um, so uh, we slightly reluctantly uh, accepted that we were going to need to uh, sign uh, our images with Microsoft's key. Um, Matthew Garrett has blogged pretty extensively about the the reasons for and against this. If you want to go read his blog. Um, Warning, may contain profanity. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, so the effect of this, that we have a, we have a package of uh, Matthew Garrett's shim uh, the software, uh, which uh, is uh, basically this is something that you can sign, which uh, contains its own key, 
uh, or its own key ring. Uh, if it is asked to, if it finds a looter that it uh, that it trusts, um, then it will chain through to that, um, and it also provides services to that looter which it can use to verify other things like the kernel. Um, so the the only the only signature we had to acquire from Microsoft is one on our package of this shim. Uh, so this does mean that any time we we rev that shim, uh, we have to go back to Microsoft and say, "Pretty please, could you could you sign this new key, uh, this new object for us?" Um, and so far, we've not had a major problem with that. Although it's, uh, it's sometimes a little slow, uh, but fortunately, the the shim is revved only very rarely. Um, for Debian, I guess there is the there is the essentially political question of uh, do we think that. Uh, uh, th that this signature, which we can't reproduce ourselves, is something that we can put in Debian main. Um, I'm not going to take a position on that, but I expect the project might want to. Um, and the the obvious the obvious outcomes are whether you uh, uh, you have uh, the shim in main and on our default CD images, or whether we say that uh, that booting on uh, on these systems, which only have the Microsoft key available, which is going to be a lot of modern systems, is something that should be relegated to the uh, to the non-free CD. Um, don't know. Uh, I, th I uh, there are some other things I can bring up, but I'll, I've talked for long enough. Does anybody else want to say something? Nobody, really. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a question of the there's a question of the signed kernel, which I guess we could go into. Right. Ben and I talked about this a bit over over dinner last night. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, so Ben mentioned you mentioned in your talk on Monday, oh sorry, on Sunday that uh, that uh, you felt uh, module signing was. Uh, was a it was an important piece of uh, yes. Of although you, you seem to think that uh, because of the because the spec refers only to uh, code loaded before execute services that that wouldn't be necessary. So it's it's certainly not necessary per the letter of the spec, uh, as as you say. It don't, it don't, the spec only requires uh, code that's executed in a it basically in a bootloader context to be uh, to be signed, um, and the. Uh, I should I should point out that the because this kind of misunderstood sometimes that the the security model of secure boot is not to it's not supposed to be to make it impossible to execute an untrusted operating system somehow. If you want that, that's more likely to be something like trusted boot, um, where you have complete recorded thing through a TPM or complete recorded execution through a TPM. That's uh, not supposed to be what Secure Boot is for. Uh, the point of it is to protect the firmware from abuse by the operating system, um, which is which is quite different. Um, so supposedly, uh, you should only have to avoid execution of, un of unsigned code in, uh, in firmware context, in boot services context. Um, <laughs> Various people have exhibited things that you can, evil things that you can do with uh, um, with uh, 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 an unsigned kernel. So I think the the mm. usual attack boils down to something like you can uh, uh, you can con you can construct uh, a, f a fake UEFI framework that makes Windows think that right. it's executed and within. Right. Windows. Yes. Right. Um, so, uh, I mean, my, my position in that is that that amounts to trying to avoid execution of an untrusted operating system, which I think is completely backwards from what Secure is intended to achieve. But uh, uh, it's not clear everybody agrees with me on that. Um, in any case, the uh, uh, so far Ubuntu has, uh, has only used... Uh, uh, we permit booting on signed kernels. Uh, at we do actually sign our kernels in order that we can jump into them in boot services context to run some quirks code in the EFI step. Uh, and uh, this is 
I think the I think the kernel has a couple of bits near the start that uh, that allow it to handle a couple of firmware quirks, um, and we'd like to make use of that. So so we do use the signed kernel for that. But if the if you present uh, the the Ubuntu Grub with a with an unsigned kernel, it will boot it will happily boot it. It'll just make sure to call exit boot services first, right. so that uh, so that you're in runtime services context. Um, I personally feel that for Debian, this kind of thing is very important. Uh, the um, uh, okay, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bootloader maintainer, so I like people to be able to to install a new bootloader as well. But uh, lots more people uh, have to install their own kernel, um, and uh, I would be pretty uncomfortable with a solution that made that impossible for people to do. Uh, without turning off uh, security features in their firmware, um, so so I personally think it's c it's quite important to be able to do that. Um, but uh, I think we probably also need the um, uh, the ability to do the whole signing stack, so that those people who do uh, control yes, I think the key uh, uh, software. Yes, yeah, and I think having uh, module signing is probably a useful feature, but it's actually separate from from supporting secure boot. It's it's part of secure boot, but it's separate from the process of enabling the the sort of default out of the box situation where you only have the Microsoft key available. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, so so far we've had no indication that Microsoft are going to revoke our key for this. Um, I guess more news as it happens because it's not really in our control. But uh, uh, so far indications seem good. So what I would want to know then is whether anyone's prepared to do the work in DAC. So uh, just one thing I also wanted. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, just one thing I also wanted to mention is um, so as Colin mentioned, there are advantages of actually booting the kernel in sign mode. Um, one thing the new shim lets you do is a machine owner key. So you can actually with the new shim you can actually create a local key that you basically tell the shim in setup mode that you trust that key on top of the one that's preloaded in it. Then you can use that locally for your own kernels and just sign it, sign them, and you can actually boot them in sign mode, um, even if they're not coming from the archive. You're regarding the the signatures of the CDs. I agree that in having the ability to have CD ship CDs that people can install without having to install an extra key would be clearly a plus. So I wonder if there is a way to have some sort of detached signature so that we distribute this, the images from the main Debian archive without signatures, but we also put somewhere else the signature so that people can like separately download the signature or something such. Yeah, the, the signature is... Um, it's embedded I can't in remember EFI. whether it's I can't remember whether it's, sorry, what did you say? The signatures are embedded in an EFI executable. They they are embedded, but the uh, there's a tool, a uh, part of SB sign tool allows you to detach and reattach the ah. the signatures. Mm -hmm. So it's a separate it's a separate uh, cough part, I think. Um you, you can or a separate cough section. You can't do it. Um it's it's a kind of elaborate procedure. Um and uh, yes, that would be possible. I'm. I guess. I guess my main concern is making sure that uh, Debian doesn't become something that you have to do all sorts of. I mean, we've made great strides forward in making the installer easier, and I'm sort of worried about the the situation where uh, people are put off Debian because you have to do this really strange procedure that's got. That that almost looks like an exploit in order to. Um, yeah. Why why would it be uh, more non-free to include a Microsoft signature than to include a Debian signature? No one else can reproduce the Debian archive signatures. This this is or Debian true. Debian CD signatures. I this is true. I'm a, I don't I'm think there's a freeness issue there. I'm proxying other people's concerns, mm. really. And uh, I know Ian Jackson, I think, raised a concern about it. I don't know if he's here. Evidently not. Um, but uh, I can I can follow up with Ian and see if we can work something out. Um, you're... From my point of view, your point's well taken. Uh, but it, it it does mean that the Debian project kind of has less freedom. Yes. It doesn't make any difference to our users, you're right. 
So uh, personally, I think that as long as you, as long as we make sure that you can uh, construct something equivalent yourself, the the important thing for me is that is, is essentially the. Um, I suppose the GPL v V3 puts it well that you you must be able to you must have enough uh, installation information and keys to be able to install your own modified version. Right. Uh, and uh, this is essentially under the control of the firmware. I think uh, once the if somebody if somebody distributed uh, a system which uh, had a lot only had the Microsoft key, did not allow you to install your own key and pre-install Debian, then I think that person would be in breach of the uh, of the mm -hmm. GPLv3 somewhere. Um, I'm not obviously not a lawyer, and I'm not sure I have a lawyer's backing for that. <laughs> but uh, but that would be my plain reading of the GPL. Um, and it, it seems kind of it seems at least to make moral sense. Um, but I, th you know, I think that's I think that's up to the distributor of the system. As long as we have systems that do let you to install your own keys, I think as long as we let you make full use of that yourself, then we're not in breach. Yep. But others may disagree. So I, I did ask, and I think you were you were starting to answer uh, who's going to work on the who would work on the DAC changes. Uh, I'm I'm willing to port the stuff I did for Launchpad into DAC. Um, it doesn't look desperately hard. It's uh, it's 140 lines of Python in, in Launchpad. So, well, plus all of the stuff I did to prepare for it. But <laughs> I, th I don't think that applies to DAC. Right. Uh, it, are there any uh, FTP masters here? Are there any FTP masters on IRC? Not at the conference, even. Mm, okay. Anyone on IRC? Hmm? No, no, okay. Okay. Possib uh, possibly you and I, Ben, should corner Steve McIntyre in Cambridge yes. and uh, work well, actually out what's going on in the CDs. Uh, well, actually, Steve said something uh, to me uh, that, uh, in fact, I should uh, I should uh, corner Steve Langshek and uh, ask mm -hmm. him why uh, why the shim isn't in uh, in Debian yet. I think that was. Uh, you'll probably get a slightly guilty looking response. <laughs> I think there, I don't think there's any particular reason the uh, probably it's just that it wasn't useful without the Microsoft signature yeah. and yeah. Uh, we had an outstanding political question about whether where that was allowed um, mm -hmm. so I guess the answer is just that we try to upload and <laughs> see see what FT master says yeah but that's um, th th the idea is they it's, it's a uh, still a two-stage build there is that right? So uh, certainly, the first for the first stage of that, there's no uh, uh, for the first stage, there's no key involved, and then right for uh, so we we have all of our all of our signed objects we split into two pieces. Uh, we have one source package shim say um, uh, that that does the normal unsigned build. Uh, we have uh, a second stage. Uh, Sign that downloads the signature from wherever and uh, and installs it. Um, aha, Ian, uh, we had a question for you. <laughs> uh, I, I gathered that you had a uh, concern about the uh, uh, main suitability of something like Shim signed the uh, the thing in Ubuntu that ha that has a Microsoft signature on the uh, first stage Shim. For secure boot, uh, would you? Uh, is that a correct representation? If so, would you care to elaborate? Uh, right. Well, Sorry I to put you on the spot. Um, I don't remember exactly what was proposed, but um, so I can't really be sure to comment accurately on on Sh a real situation. Well, shall I shall I just explain quickly, or uh, it's probably easiest if I deal with the hypothetical, which is probably <laughs> true. Okay. Um, I have a problem with the idea that there's a package in main that contains signatures that we can't regenerate. Um, it's okay, in my view, if the signature 
um, if the, the places where the public key is installed are places that are also controlled by the user. Um, so for example, I don't have a problem with the archive key. Um, also, the, you know, the user cannot generate their own signed release files, but on the other hand, if they want to do that, they can just change the public key on their system. So if the user can't change the public key, then there's a problem if they can't, you know, do the signature themselves. So I, uh, yeah, I agree that that situation would be a problem. At, at present, all systems that I know of that uh, can, and this is required by Microsoft's current guidelines, uh, that contain the Microsoft key for um, secure boot on x86, uh, also have the ability for users to install their own key. Right, and, and in so. if that's the case, then that's all right, although I understand the situation is a bit more difficult on ARM. The situation is indeed more difficult on ARM, and uh, at personally on ARM, I would be rather reluctant to distribute a, uh, a system that included Grub, because uh, I'm not at all clear that that system as a whole would comply with the GPLv3. But, but uh, I mean, ARM is, you know, Windows is an irrelevance on ARM. Linux owns ARM. Right. Uh, so, ARM, sort in of in <laughs> indeed, whether anybody in comply, whether interested. anybody feels that it's remotely important to comply with the Windows uh, guidelines on ARM, unless they're Microsoft Surface, uh, is unclear as yet. Um, I don't know. Uh, the uh, I guess from my point of view, this is a property of the system that you're installing it on, rather than a property of that Debian can control. Well, yes, but the the thing is that there are certain things where we know that the user is able to change the public key because it's part of the system that we ship. In that case, there's definitely no problem. If we have some good assurance that there's some other m means, social means, um, some legal means, who knows, that means that in practice the user will almost always be able to replace that key, then that's probably okay too. Um, if, in practice, we expect that the user isn't able to replace the key, then that's a problem, and there's a sort of huge grey area in between. Right, so, so it's essentially a judgment call on, on how firm we think the, uh, the Microsoft Windows 8 logo requirements are. I guess. Well, I also... Mean, that's, that's the thing that, that we're relying on right now. Also, we could see whether the systems that are shipped in practice do, in fact, have this feature enabled. Um, we could go ahead and... and make the signatures now and then if we discover that in fact it's a problem, we could stop signing things when we, you know, if we decide that, that it's not conformant to our principles. That makes sense. Okay. Thanks for elaborating. Um, I th for, uh, Stefan can probably say more. I think, uh, have we actually, have we seen any that, any systems as yet that do not permit the user to install their own key? So, no. Um, currently, uh, qu quite a few machines, uh, specifically Lenovo, make, don't have the, um, the firmware options you said, where you can actually type, in, type it in. But they all have the option to switch to setup mode. And then you can use something like the binary generated by the FE tool package, which lets you generate a local PKI on your machine, generates a lockdown.efi binary with that one in there. Then you boot that binary, and it essentially creates all of the NVRAM viable and it locks down the system with keys that are not the Microsoft keys. Like my current Lenovo laptop doesn't have the Windows keys on, the, on it. It instead has keys that I generated myself. Uh, so I can actually test new machines. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was with regard to um, s the Windows RT stuff. Um, as far as I know, the current requirement on those is that it, um, indeed it doesn't let you switch to setup mode at all. It doesn't let you turn off secure boot, but it doesn't even let you boot any operating system that currently is signed by Microsoft because it's a different key than the one that mm -hmm. we have for UEFA, on, uh, for, for example, for Ubuntu. So they don't sign third-party operating systems at all on those. So, so there is a question with, with you know, I, I, I'm not sure I followed everything you said there. Um, the question is, you know, when we say the user needs to be able to change the key, we, we don't necessarily mean that the user can change the key if they spend all afternoon. <laughs> right? It, the, the right. I, if there's some kind of relatively straightforward process by which the key can be changed. And that, mm -hmm. I think so that's also important. Yeah, we, we actually messed, uh, discussed that with Steve. Uh, and in theory, we can 
uh, package FA tool, which is a kind of tool to generate those keys, to, so that you can just install the package. It generates a new PKI at that point. Then you can just use SB sign to sign any binary that you want. Right, it sounds just like we need to automate this. Right, so it's basically uh, you need to boot, to go to get into your BIOS once, set it to setup mode, boot into Debian, run that thing. It's going to populate the keys with the ones it just generates. And from that point on, you can have hooks into, um, I suppose, gr um, the shame or something to it, so that it signs them whenever you install a new binary. So you you mentioned earlier the shim machine owner key thing, which I think Susa did originally and mm -hmm. uh, ended up in shim. Uh, the does uh, so your your system doesn't have the Microsoft keys at all on it. But if you're prepared to leave the Microsoft keys there, uh, does uh, the machine owner key system help? Uh, can you use that to I register your own key? Uh, yes, except that I was testing the shim, so I would have. I would have needed the first shim to put the second shim to put the <laughs> which right, would have okay. been a bit tricky, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's that's a specialized case that I don't right. think is going to affect most people. Yeah, I, th I think most people will be fine. Uh, essentially, always, well, by default, going to uh, a Windows sign, a Microsoft signed shim, and then just put whatever they want by adding keys in the m uh, as a machine owner key in there. Okay, um, so so the next step, I suppose, is 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 DAC, is the DAC uh, changes, and then after that, um, people can work on the um, uh, Grub and Shim packages and right. so the, the CD building. So DAC, as I say, uh, I'm willing to sort out. Uh, always assuming that FTP master doesn't hit the approach I took. Um, the uh, I can deal with Grub. Um, I'd like somebody who knows it better to deal with Shim, but uh, I guess Steve or Stefan could do that perhaps. Um, uh, CDMH, it's probably best if somebody who knows that better deals with it. Uh, I think Steve is probably mostly waiting for the bits in the archive to yep. be ready. Yep. I think that's probably it. So we seem to have something like a plan. That seems roughly coherent. Um, do you, uh, you... You mentioned in your talk on Monday that you were... Um, that there was a question of what we do with out-of-tree uh, modules. Uh, yes, if we go, if we were to uh, require module signing in some in secure boot mode or in some uh, as an optional uh, restriction, in right? I mean, mode. even I, I, never mind necessarily requiring it. But if, uh, as I say, to, to me, the module sign is something that you might wish to enable on a system where you're in control of the keys and yep. uh, you want to to make sure that you. You know, basically a beefed up version of the traditional sysadmin, sysadmin practice of disabling module loading if you, uh, if you, if you mm. want to avoid certain classes of attacks. And it seems reasonable to, to require module signing for that. But um, uh, then do, does anybody know how to deal with this for out of tree builds? I had the impression that the, uh, the, well the key was that was used for signing the uh, internal this, modules is um, ephemeral. There was this. Uh, uh, Matthew Garrett was working on something to add keys into the kernel uh, where, in fact, the key format was going to be Im a key embedded into a signed EFI blob that the uh, assigned EFI executive blob because that's what Microsoft signs. And then that would be the way of delivering just a key into the kernel. And uh, Linus was extremely blunt in rejecting this. Uh, uh, along the lines of why should we care what Microsoft's key signing format exactly, is? Exactly, yes. Not to mention that as, uh, I, I don't think so I mentioned this, but I think that the uh, the, the requirement for the uh, for the signing key um, that signs shim is that it has to be a two th specifically a 2048-bit RSA key. I think that's right. Um, so it has some rather odd limitations. Um, in, in Ubuntu, we arranged to have a, a separate, uh, for it actually to go through a separate master key. Uh, so we keep the master right. key offline and have that sign the 
actual operational signing key. Uh, so at least we have some recourse if, uh, in the event that the archi that the FTP master system is compromised. Yeah, uh, I think that would be I think that would be sensible for Debian to do, but I don't know who would deal with the master key um, ascribe arrangements. Mm. Um, do this plan also have all that's needed for DI? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Uh, I was thinking about DI uh, and Debian Live, and how does that fit in? Right, so um, you need a couple of changes to the later parts of to the later parts of DI. Uh, you need to change. Uh, I think it was the kernel installation code and obviously Grub installer. Um, they're relatively minor changes. They're essentially to install the signed, uh, respective signed packages as well. Um, those are straightforward enough. The uh, You also have to obviously arrange to boot things somehow. Uh, what I did in what I did in Ubuntu was uh, I had our grub package spit out two, uh, two different signed objects. One of them is intended for use on normal systems. Uh, so you, you basically have to um, build monolithic grub images uh, analogous to a monolithic kernel uh, that have all of, the, all of the bits that you think you might need. Uh, so uh, I generated one image that, was that contained all of the stuff that you might need to boot a normal system uh, and another image that contains all of the things you might need to boot from, uh, from removable media. Uh, the removable media case, uh, in its startup sequence, it hunts through all of the devices attached to the system for things that have dot disk slash whatever it is in DI. Um, it's not particularly elegant, but uh, it seems to get the job done. Um, I think that uh, I know that uh, s that Steve McIntyre cargo filtered some of the code that I did uh, for EFI images and DI. Um, so I think it's, so. It's probably not very difficult at this point to port the rest of it over. W would that al also apply to Debian Live image? Uh, yeah. Well, Debian Live is is basically a, um, a DI in it already with uh, the Live Installer UDEV, isn't it? So uh, unless that's changed. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, it would apply to them as well. Uh, assuming that they have the only the only assumption would be that they have the uh, dot disk subdirectory of the of their top level images with, I think it's info, uh, inside it. Um, if they don't, then it's trivial to add. Anyone else? No, no one on IRC. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, uh, then I short think meeting. We're done. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, Ben.